Um, I've approached this very differently uh, and with a great deal of frustration as an electrophysiologist because there are some sobering statistics. 30 to 50 percent of sudden cardiac deaths due to coronary disease occur as the first cardiac event. One third of sudden cardiac deaths occur in patients with known coronary disease or risk markers but power insufficient to be a useful marker of sudden death and only a small percent have well-established risk markers. Therefore, in two-thirds or so, we're unable to predict the individual at risk for sudden death. The risk factors lack specificity, sensitivity, and predictive accuracy. We can identify populations at risk, but not the individual with sufficient degree that I would put an ICD uh, in these individuals. And these are major problems. The, the standard risk factors are on the left that, that we're all aware of and some exciting new ones that are being explored from CRP to others as well. But if you look at some data, for example, in Made It 2, uh, this shows time from myocardial infarction in the conventionally treated and the ICD treated groups. And uh, one sees that the mortality continues to increase after the initial event. And if you look at a, another study, this is from Maastricht, the median time from myocardial infarction to sudden cardiac arrest was nine years. How do you predict that? And if the myocardium is remodeling, this was uh, an editorial that I wrote for an article that uh, uh, Gene and uh, Mark Pfeffer uh, published, uh, what triggers sudden cardiac death? Why did the patient die on Tuesday and not on Monday or on Wednesday? What was the change? And I would submit to you that the CRP data, though did predict groups at risk for sudden death, uh, is not specific enough. Because I think there's an interaction between an anatomic or functional substrate, transient initiating events, and then the basic arrhythmia mechanisms that lead to sudden death. And to illustrate this, I pulled out a case report we published 20 years ago. This is a 40-year-old man who developed an incessant supraventricular tachycardia after his second infarct and the development of right bundle. Now, if you look on the left, just look at the scalar ECG. He's got sinus rhythm, and then as the rate increases seven beats a minute, he develops a supraventricular tachycardia, and that was more or less incessant. We studied this individual, and it turned out he had an ex a concealed accessory pathway. Now, he was born with that, but he never had his first episode of tachycardia until he developed an infarct with a right bundle. He had the substrate all this time, but no, never developed tachycardia. So what happened? You see on the top, prior to the infarct, the conduction went down the AV node and Hisperkinsey system rapidly, and every time it attempted to turn around, do we have a laser? Ah, oh, great. Uh, into the accessory pathway, the accessory pathway was found to be refractory, and it always met with block. Thank you. Here. Now, after the infarct, with the right bundle, his Hisperkinsey conduction prolonged 40 milliseconds. During a rate of 74, he still gets down quickly enough and can't turn around to re-enter and have tachycardia, but when the rate increased a little bit more, there was further slowing of conduction, and now he could re-enter. My point is that remodeling that alters conduction by a few milliseconds can start a tachycardia in a substrate that was present for 50 years but never used. It, only, it, it took the development of a bundle branch block for this to happen. And this may indeed make that individual nine years after his infarct uh, a candidate for sudden death. Now, there's some speculative data here, but uh, I want to show you one study which we published about different sites of uh, premature ventricular beats and whether or not they could start a tachycardia. Uh, this is the use of uh, optical mapping in an isolated wedge preparation, but the, the, the 
guts of the data are here. We created ischemia in this model. Now the epicardium is more sensitive to the effects of ischemia than is the endocardium for unknown reasons. During, uh, prior to ischemia, conduction, uh, when we stimulate the epicardium here, travels to the endocardium without any problems. Stimulate the endocardium, travels to the epicardium without any problems. Now with 390 seconds of ischemia, there's lateral conduction delay, but still transmural conduction. The endocardium is more resistant to ischemia, so there's good propagation. Now after 500 seconds of ischemia, there's lateral block. The impulse travels to the endocardium and re-enters to the epicardium. The impulse here travels normally. What does this mean? Well, if you had a PVC arising in the endocardium, it would propagate without delay, block, or re-entry. But a PVC starting in the epicardium would produce lateral block and re-entry and precipitate VT or VF. And let me show you the, the images. This is now uh, after 500 seconds of ischemia. We're pacing the epicardium, and you see the re-entry, classic figure of eight. But we pace the endocardium, and there's propagation transmurally with no conduction delay or block. So depending on where a PVC arose, it could initiate or not initiate VT or VF. So uh, I, we call these windows of opportunity, and timing is very critical for the development of reentrant uh, uh, arrhythmias. So you need timing, and you need a substrate. Now you also need uh, to, to consider the, the uh, site of the infarct and the areas of reentry that may or may not produce uh, a, a tachyarrhythmia. This is from a, another. Uh, study in an animal. This is the scar uh, or the uh, border uh, zone scar with the infarct over here using optical mapping and I just want to make a, a couple of points. Um, the anatomic location of the reentrant circuit in VT uh, involves the ischemic uh, or the infarct uh, area and the reentrant loop is as uh, depicted here. And uh, I can skip that one, but show you the actual uh, pictures. Uh, these this, uh, are four beats. This is the first one, the second one, the third one. Now you're seeing progressive conduction delay over here. And the fourth one with conduction delay and now reentry. And this is how VT starts. This, is, this could be sudden death if the timing were very critical. And there can be clockwise reentry, uh, as you see on this side. Or counterclockwise reentry in the same model. But if the timing is not exquisitely accurate, one gets non-sustained VT. Here, for example, there, this is the premature beat, which re-enters a couple of times, blocks here, and stops. And then there's no VT and no sudden death. Uh, and uh, if there is no uh, area of conduction delay and block, for example, over here, the propagation though not uniform, does not create the area of block for re-entry to occur, this animal did not have inducible ventricular tachycardia. So how do we pick any of this up looking at risk factors? Yet these are the, the parameters that determine whether or not uh, a tachyarrhythmia is sustained and whether sudden death uh, occurs. Therefore, timing and activation sequence determine whether or not VTVF will occur after an infarct. Uh, and I, I, I don't know how to, to uh, evaluate that with uh, risk factor analysis. I want to show you one other piece of data that we're actually presenting in a couple of days uh, and, and raise the, the potential issue whether a period of ischemia can predispose 
to ventricular tachycardial fibrillation by other mechanisms. Uh, this is again the, the same animal model, uh, this canine ventricular wedge, and uh, this was a creation of a long QT3. This is uh, sodium inactivation, uh, which can be uh, replicated uh, with uh, anthropurine. Uh, and my, uh, the purpose of this study was to determine whether an episode of ischemia sensitized the myocardium to the effects of this long QT prolonging drug. And uh, this is the, uh, the animal model, um, the uh, isolated wedge. This wedge had 40 minutes of ischemia and then reperfusion before application of the drug. And at this point, the electrophysiology was totally normal. So 40 minutes of ischemia, complete recovery, and then drug. While this uh, group of wedges just had uh, perfusion with no ischemia. I'm almost through. And uh, uh, what I'll show you over here is that the exposure to 40 minutes of ischemia made this myocardium very vulnerable with a significant QT prolongation compared to control. And uh, we'll, we'll show you that. Uh, the images will correspond to the tracings below. So this is the first beat that's over here. This is the second beat. eventually. It's a slow speed. And then there's a repetitive response that was uh, spontaneous. This is the fourth pace beat over here. And then the fifth. And then spontaneous tachyarrhythmia. Now, initially, this is focal activity that's rather haphazard, and then you'll see very nice reentry develop. And here's the reentry now. And this did not happen in the other uh, wedges that did not have an episode of ischemia. So we raise the issue can an episode of ischemia? make the myocardium vulnerable to an intervention to which it was not vulnerable prior to the episode of ischemia. And this may have relevance in patients with long QT or in individuals who are taking drugs that prolong the QT that have a much greater effect after an episode of ischemia than prior. So prior episode of ischemia, even after apparent electrophysiologic recovery, enhances the arrhythmogenicity in this long QT3 model through the development of early after depolarizations and reentry, raising the issue whether ischemia can sensitize patients with long QT and possibly uh, other situations as well. So the, the problems from the electrophysiology standpoint are very great. Uh, the triggers are myocardial EP processes that probably determine the onset or lack of VTVF or sudden death which are difficult to measure clinically, and the indirect EP surrogates don't really measure these uh, phenomena and, and obviously give us no clue about mechanisms, and we must continue to rely on other indirect risk factors for now. I agree absolutely with what Dr. Dr. Brownwall uh, presented. That's the state of the art, but we don't understand the EP as to why he fibrillated on Tuesday and not on Monday or Wednesday. And the way to approach that is to have rapid automated external defibrillator uh, deployment and uh, an initiative we started in Indianapolis, which uh, I've called the Neighborhood Heart Watch. These are like large mailboxes in, in which an AED is placed. Uh, these are distributed. Uh, we've only put five up so far. This one's on my lawn in uh, Indianapolis. <laughs> And uh, all 38 houses that live around this area have keys to this box and have access to the AED. We must never forget that 8 out of 10 sudden cardiac deaths occur in the home. 
so that you can have AEDs in all the airports and athletic events you want, you only get one out of five. And this is an attempt then to get the AED out into the home, into the community, and allow rapid access while we're still trying to unravel the uh, basic electrophysiology. Thank you very much.